Hello there and welcome back to Miss Yusuf's English class. In this video, we're going to read chapter 32 and chapter 33. Remember that this one is a video in a series of videos in which we cover the entire story. So let's read chapter 32. There are many examples of animals coming to surprising living arrangements. All are instances of that animal equivalent of anthropomorphism zoomorphism, where an animal takes a human being or another animal to be one of its kind. The most famous case is also the most common, the pet dog, which has so assimilated humans into the realm of doghood as to want to mate with them, a fact that any dog owner who has had to pull an amorous dog from the leg of a mortified visitor will confirm. Our golden agouti and spotted parka got along very well, contentedly huddling together and sleeping against each other until the first was stolen. I have already mentioned our rhinoceros and goat herd and the case of circus lions. There are confirmed stories of drowning sailors being pushed up to the surface of the water and held there by dolphins, a characteristic way in which these marine mammals help each other. A case is mentioned in the literature of a stoat and a rat living in a companion relationship, while other rat presented to the stoat were devoured by it in a typical way of stoats. We had our own case of the freak suspension of the predator-prey relationship. We had a mouse that lived for several weeks with the vipers. While other mice dropped in the terrarium disappeared within two days, this little brown Methuselah built itself a nest, stored the grains we gave it in various hideaways, and scampered about in plain sight of the snakes. We were amazed. We put up a sign to bring the mouse to the public's attention. It finally met its end in a curious way. A young viper bit it. Was the viper unaware of the mouse's special status? and socialized to it, perhaps? Whatever the case, the mouse was bitten by a young viper, but devoured, and immediately, by an adult. If there was a spell, it was broken by the young one. Things returned to normal after that. All mice disappeared down the viper's gullets at the usual rate. In the trade, dogs are sometimes used as foster mothers for lion cubs. Though the cubs grow to become larger than their caregiver and far more dangerous, they never give their mother trouble and she never loses her placid behaviour Sorry, or her sense of authority over her litter. Signs have to be put up to explain to the public that the dog is not live food left for the lion, just as we had to put up a sign pointing out that the rhinoceros are herbivores and do not eat goats. What could be the explanation for zoomorphism? Can't a rhinoceros distinguish big from small, tough height from soft fur? Isn't it plain to a dolphin what a dolphin is like? I believe the answer lies in something I mentioned earlier. That measure of madness that moves life in strange but saving ways. The golden agouti, like the rhinoceros, was in need of companionship. The circus lions don't care to know that their leader is a weakling human. The fiction guarantees their social well-being and staves off violent anarchy. As for the lion cubs, they would positively keel over with fright if they knew that their mother was a dog, for that would mean that they were motherless, an absolute worst condition imaginable for any young, warm-blooded life. I am sure even the vi adult viper, as it swallowed the mouse, must have felt somewhere in its undeveloped mind a twinge of regret, a feeling that something greater was just missed, an imaginative leap away from the lonely, crude reality of a reptile. Chapter 33 He shows me family memorabilia. Wedding photos first, a Hindu wedding with Canada prominently on the edges, a younger him, a younger her. They went to Niagara Falls for their honeymoon, had a lovely time, smiles to prove it. We move back in time, Photos from his student days at U of T with friends, in front of St. Mike's, in his room, during Diwali on Gerard Street, reading at St. Basil's Church dressed in a white gown, wearing another kind of white gown in a lab of the zoology department, on graduation day, a smile every time, but his eyes tell another story. Photos from Brazil with plenty of three-toed slots in situ. With the turn of a page, we jump over the Pacific, and there is next to nothing. He tells me that the camera did click regularly on all the usual important occasions, but everything was lost. 
what little day is consists of what was assembled by Mamaji and mailed over after the events. There is a photo taken at the zoo during the visit of a VIP. In black and white, another world is revealed to me. The photo is crowded with people. A union cabinet minister is the focus of attention. There is a giraffe in the background. Near the edge of the group, I recognize a younger Mr. Adirubasami. Mamaji? I ask, pointing. Yes, he says. There is a man next to the minister with horn-rimmed glasses and hair very cleanly combed. He looks like a plausible Mr. Patel, face rounder than his son's. Is this your father? I ask. He shakes his head. I don't know who that is. There is a pause of a few seconds and he says, It is my father who took the picture. On the same page, there's another group shot, mostly of school children. He taps the photo. That's Richard Parker. I am amazed. I look closely, trying to extract personality from appearance. Unfortunately, it's black and white again and a little out of focus. A photo taken in better days, casually. Richard Parker is looking away. He doesn't even realize that his picture is being taken. The opposing page is entirely taken up by a color photo of the swimming pool of the Orobido Ashram. It is a nice big outdoor pool with clear sparkling water, a clean blue bottom and an attached diving pool. The next page features a photo of the front gate of the Petit Seminary School. An arch has the school's motto painted on it, Null Magnum Nisi Bonum, No Greatness Without Goodness. And that's it. An entire childhood memorialized in four nearly irrelevant photographs. He grows somber. The worst of it, he says, is that I can hardly remember what my mother looks like anymore. I can see her in my mind, but it's fleeting. As soon as I try to have a good look at her, she fades. It's the same with her voice. If I saw her again on the street, it will all come back, but that's not likely to happen. It's very sad not to remember what your mother looks like. He closes the book. Okay, that brings us to the end of chapter 33. Stay tuned for chapter 34. Until then, take care of yourself. I'll see you soon.